When restoration has taken place biblically, according to Galatians 6, 1 and 2, that person is restored to the Lord and should be restored to the body immediately. But also, that person needs to rebuild their life. They need to rebuild trust with the church, with their friends, with their family. So what I advocate is a rebuilding team, not a restoration team. Let's assume that's already taken place because of Galatians 6.1. The person has been broken, they've repented, they've been restored to the Lord, and they've been restored now to the body. But let's help them rebuild. Let's help them get on with their lives. So I look for a group of spiritual men again that can help this individual rebuild his life. There will be some questions running through the mind of that person that wants to rebuild because he's been hurt, he's been damaged, he is really suspicious of people, whether they really want to help him or not. Some of the questions he may, he may have in his mind are these. Can I really trust these people, this group that wants to help me rebuild? Will they maintain confidentiality? Have they already lost respect for me or do they still see me as a valuable person? Uh, do they genuinely care about me? Are they just fulfilling an assignment or do they, are they really committed to helping me rebuild my life? Can they actually help me? Are they mature, godly individuals? Will they speak the truth in love? Do they genuinely care about me? Those are the kind of things that will go, in, go through the mind of the person that wants to rebuild his life. But once he's confident of that, he becomes teachable, he's humble, and that gathering with those people can be a warm, gracious, loving fellowship. And I, I've seen that happen with my friend Jeff. But how should the church respond now to a repentant, restored person? We have taught, taught and shared in these lectures how you should respond to an unrepentant person, the biblical guidelines, but the Bible also gives us guidelines of how to respond to a repentant person. Keep those things clear in mind. How we respond to an unrepentant, all the scriptures we gave. Now, how to respond to repentant. The best passage of scripture on this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. The background on that is in 1 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul was really upset with the church, even more so than the city man, because he didn't deal with it. But after he counseled the church of how to deal with it, and they must have dealt with it, because Paul says, now that worked. You finally followed the instructions I gave you. That man has been repentant, broken and repentant. Now this is what you need to do. Let me read the verses and then comment on them. Paul well, says, if anyone has caused grief, that man certainly did. He has not so much grieved me as he grieved all of you, to some extent not to put it too severely. Now listen, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. They finally exercise church discipline. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him. Why? So that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything, if you would follow biblical principles of church discipline. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Now do this in order that Satan might not outwit you, for you're not unaware of his schemes. What an incredible 
wonderful, beautiful, powerful passage of Scripture. Again, it needs to be followed to the letter, just like the passage needs to be followed to the letter for an unrepentant person. Now remember, we're talking about a man who is deeply in sin, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, a terrible situation. He was involved in sexual immorality with his stepmother. The church knew about it, did nothing about it. Paul was upset. He comes to them. He gives them clear guidance. He said, what you need to do is exercise church discipline. Expel that man from you. Turn him over to Satan so that his flesh would be destroyed. Very strong language. Three times in that one chapter, he says, put that man out, put him out, put him out. Finally, the church says, we better obey. And they exercise church discipline. Now, what happened is because they exercised church discipline, did it biblically, God went to work on that man. We don't know all the details, but it's pretty clear that that man came to his senses, was broken, repented, and now they became aware. Now what should the church do? What is their responsibility? He, he has been restored to the Lord. Now, quickly, the church needs to welcome him back. And here's what he says we're to do. He said, be sensitive to that man, because he uses the word sufficient. Enough, don't proclaim it, don't keep him out. It's, it's done, it's over. Sufficient has been the discipline. It's been effective, it's done what it was intended to do, now welcome him back. Second thing he says, be forgiving. Forgive him, verbalize it, tell him, as far as we're concerned, you are completely forgiven. You are completely restored to the body. Everything is good. You are welcome back. We're not going to bring this up before you again. It's under the blood of Christ. Sufficient, forgiving, be forgiving. I like this next word. He says, comfort him. Be comfort him. Don't stand aloof from him. Don't keep holding him at arm's length. They've been deeply wounded. They need emotional healing now. They need comfort. They need to be surrounded by love and caring people and needs to know. He's very fragile. People are very fragile after they've gone through experience like this because they have been hobbled. They've been broken. They've been devastated by, by their sin. They are filled with regrets. They need somebody to put their arm around them and comfort them. They need to feel they're in a very safe environment now. Second thing it says, be loving. Reaffirm. Paul says, reaffirm your love for him. Tell him, we love you. Uh, they need to not only hear love, they need to feel it. They need to sense it. And that is so powerful because they have felt so unloving. How can anybody love me after what I did? And there are people that treat them in an unloving way. And he says, for you as a church, the body of Christ, you have a responsibility to show love, shower them with love. People sometimes are afraid to do that. But that's what they need. Then the last thing he says is be alert. Be alert that Satan doesn't take advantage of you. He said, we know his schemes. When does Satan take advantage of a church? Well, many, many ways, obviously, but especially in church discipline. And that's our topic in these lectures. Satan has taken advantage of church after church after church because they haven't exercised church discipline. If they've tried to do it, they've done it in the wrong way. If they've done church discipline in the right way and they've not restored it in the right way, Satan has taken advantage. Church that I know of, one that I mentioned earlier in the lectures, this large, thriving church. The man was a great Bible teacher. He sinned, he fell. The church didn't exercise discipline 
All they did is just excommunicate him, get him out of the way. They didn't follow the first three steps. And the man went off, and they told him not to come back, not to be around. He certainly repented, was broken. I've spent hours talking with him. I know, I know his heart, I believe, very clearly. That church had over a million dollars in a building fund, over a thousand people in attendance. Today, that church doesn't exist. Nobody even knows what happened to the money. Another church was gonna start out of that church. It went for a little while, it folded. That church is gone off the map. And that individual is still in limbo <laughs> out here. Sad beyond words. I thought often what would happen if that church had followed biblical principles, followed Matthew 18, they would have only gotten to maybe the second step of Matthew 18, and that person would have been restored. They would have won their brother back. And that would have been a glorious day for that church, not to put him back in the pulpit immediately. That wasn't the point. He wasn't asking for that, for a job back, anything else. All he was asking for is forgiveness. He had gotten it from God, now he wanted it from the body. Now if that church body had said, all right, God has done his work in the life of that man. He has responded right. We don't need to treat him harshly. What we need to do is we need to forgive him, comfort him, reaffirm our love for him, and not let Satan use this in the life of that man or in the life of our church. Who knows what would have happened to that church today? We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. So there's one other thing I, I encourage the church to do. Not only be sensitive, be forgiving, be comforting, be loving, be alert, follow that passage, but do this. Once that prodigal has come back, we've gone through this, celebrate restoration. Churches celebrate when somebody comes to know Christ, and we should. The angels in heaven celebrate over one sinner that has come to faith in Christ, and we get excited, and we should. I get really excited when I see an unbeliever, somebody that has had no regard for Jesus Christ, come to faith in Christ, be born again by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah, praise God, let's celebrate. We make them stand up, we baptize them, and we clap and we rejoice and we're thrilled. What about when a saint stumbles and falls and then repents and wants to come back? Okay, you can come back, but you just keep your mouth shut, you be quiet, and we don't even announce it. That is a cause for celebration. Bring them back and celebrate what God has done and how God has restored them. His saving grace is wonderful, but his restorative grace is just as wonderful that God restores. God takes a broken life, takes all the pieces, puts it back together, makes that person, isn't that exciting? Shouldn't that be celebrated? From the pulpit, in front of the congregation, because he's been disciplined publicly, everybody knows that, so publicly, his return and restoration should be celebrated. I shared this with a pastor once. I said, you know, I know this person. And he wants to be back in the church. And he has really been <laughs> repentant. And God has done a marvelous work in his life. And I said to the pastor, I said, your church needs to follow this biblical principles here. But I said, wouldn't it be great? And it was Easter Sunday, I remember. I said, Easter is coming up. I said, wouldn't that be wonderful on Easter Sunday to have this person up front? Everybody knows about him, knows what's happened to him, knows that he has been broken and uh, restored to the Lord. Wouldn't it be incredible? 
on Easter Sunday when we talk about the victory of Jesus Christ and his power, not only to raise the dead, but that he's paid for all of our sins. And I said, we could have a celebration that would be awesome here. The pastor looked at me and said, no. He said, that would be true dramatic. I said, grace is dramatic. There's nothing more dramatic than the grace of God. And I said, what that would do to the body, how that would defeat Satan, how that would glorify God, how that would lift up grace without compromising truth in any way, shape, or form. Let's do it. No. And again, that church suffered. And I don't know what the problem is, but I do know this, under no circumstance should we leave a repentant, broken person who has been restored to God, unrestored by the church and not celebrated and not brought back in and not uh, celebrating and rejoicing over him and church leaders should lead the celebration.